Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our next speaker, Sir Kenson. Thanks guys, it's awesome to be here. It's my first time at RootCon and uh, first time in the Philippines. It's been great. My name is Jeff Kitson. I'm a security researcher for uh, Spider Labs, Trustwave, and uh, I'm doing a presentation today called Trainwreck. It'll become pretty obvious why that's the title as we go forward. And there's a lot of text-heavy, code-heavy slides. I don't expect you to consume all of them, but I put a lot of stuff in here for you guys to look at later uh, on the slides on your own to help you kind of further the research. Uh, I started with web development and kind of back away to information security. So I do a lot of Ruby, Python, uh, code, and that's sort of my background. I'll say I just heard myself more. OK. Uh, the vulnerability that I found was in an IoT thermostat that sort of entered my life in a unique way. Our objective today, we're going to go over how I found this um, and how this happened to me in the first place, what exactly I found and why it's dangerous, and the story of how we got the vendor to fix it, which is its own uh, avenue. And I'm going to distribute tools for you guys so that you can actually poke at any of these vulnerable devices if you have a client you're doing research against and they have this unpatched in their network, you can use this additional finding and actually also you know, use it to find more vulnerabilities in these devices because I think that there's a lot more to be found. All right, so how all this got started. I live in Michigan, it gets pretty cold there in the winter. And last winter, around December 29th, my furnace failed. And Michigan, if your furnace fails in the middle of winter, that's a really big problem. Your pipes freeze, uh, It'll destroy your house. It's horrible. And I'm actually sort of lucky I didn't lose my life on this one because the failure was a crack in the heating sheet. It might be a little difficult to uh, to see up there, but there's a number of cracks on this pipe, and that's when the burning natural gas will get into your circulating air for your house, and that's how you die of carbon monoxide poisoning in your sleep. So it's kind of scary to find out that this is a problem, and it was so dangerous that the technician said, if I law, I have to shut this off, and you have to get this. And when you're facing this sort of failure on a furnace, uh, your options aren't good. The cost of replacing this one part is pretty much the same cost as getting a new furnace altogether. And there's incentives in the US for getting a new furnace, it's more efficient. You know, the energy companies like that, and they help you out. Um, so I needed to replace it, and I felt a lot like the kid in this gift. And the local dealer that I was working with offered train units. That's why it's called a train wreck. So if they offer train units, it's a package of furnace, thermostat, and it's not really an option of what you get. They package the whole thing together, and in order for the furnace to work as directed, you have to use this thermostat that you're going to get. And I'm a nerd, I'm a security researcher, I have a lot of IoT stuff in my house. That's fair. I chose that stuff. This is the first time that I had something forced on me. And the model that I selected came with a thermostat called the XL850. Comfort Link 2 XL850. So what exactly did I buy? I bought an IoT thermostat, a new furnace, had to install in my house. This is a screenshot from the vendor's page, and they've got a lot of bullet points on all the cool stuff that it does. It's got many features, of course, that you would expect from an IoT thermostat. It's got uh, weather maps and uh, a lot of things like remote software uploads which will come into play. And that definitely piqued my interest when I saw the link on the vendor page saying, hey, you need to download and update your firmware, your software? We've got it here. Just load it onto a USB, plug it into the USB port on your thermostat, and it'll boot that new image and update itself. So I'm being handed the source code for this IoT thermostat. It, uh, it really seemed too easy. And the link up there at the top, is the link that you would see if you had gone to this page a while back. I think we spooked them quite a bit when we disclosed this because they actually don't publish that link anymore. They say coming soon that you'll be able to download the, uh, the new image sometime soon, but they have yet to actually publish it on the website, even though they've pushed a few updates and it would seem natural that you want people to update uh, the software when there's a known vulnerability. Alright, XL850. We've got more internet, more Z-Wave. This speaks Z-Wave, so it's meant to talk to a bunch of stuff in your house. So it should be 100% more fun. It costs $4 signs, whatever that means. To this day, I still don't really know 
how much it would cost on its own. There's a couple comparable devices that you can buy individually on Amazon or eBay, and uh, they run at least a couple hundred bucks, but this one itself isn't available uh, on its own normally to consumers. It comes as a package deal with your furnace, and you get it really without much of a choice. The features that uh, we would expect and this thing has, you can remotely administrate your temperature and your heating schedules. You can do it either from a phone app or a website. And you have to pay a subscription of 10 bucks a month for this privilege. It's not worth it. Uh, you can also uh, have weather maps and uh, weather updates downloaded to the device. And all that really means is that you'll see a little radar image that you can get for free just by browsing to Weather Underground. Uh, and it's based on your zip code. They use very weak authentication to download that data. And there's also a lot of administration tools to Nexia, which is a partner company that worked with Train to push out this device. And Nexia has a lot of things they can do that the user can't. That includes SSHing into your device, pulling analytics, alarm logs. Um, this thing, if you have a problem, if it notices a failure, it actually has the information of the company that installed it, and it will send them a fax or a phone call and say, hey, this person's furnace is failing, you need to go out and take a look at it. So it sets off alarms. It also has U wave integration, like I said. So this thing has a Nexia bridge included in it. And that should allow it to talk to a bunch of other stuff in your house, which makes it even worse. So the first day I get this thing, I'm poking around on it. And I notice Ruby Gems license. It's a great thing about open source. They have to list all the source uh, packages that are open source that they use. So they have a bunch of disclosed licenses in there, which really gives you a roadmap of what you should look for when you're reversing the code. I'm a Ruby guy. Most of my daily work is done in Ruby. So this was like a dream come true. I was excited. And there's a whole bunch of other packages in there too. As you can see, there's 187 pages of software licenses. There's a lot of stuff. All right, XL 850. We know this thing connects to the internet and it does a bunch of stuff. So what do we do? We pull up NMAP and we sniff the ports. Found a lot of them. Found one that NMAP listed as a Napster. Well, it's not Napster, um, but I guess you could consider it a proprietary protocol. And then there's a bunch of other ones as well, but uh, this port 9999 is really the focus of this talk. And it illustrates that there's a lot of services still available on this device uh, that really aren't that secure. So, the smell test. We know these ports, we know that they're uh, responding to NMAP or giving you data. So we start issuing netcat and telemet commands to them, and we get some really odd stuff back. These two ports that offer uh, command entry really aren't even covered in this talk because they're, they're, they're a whole other uh, aspect of the device. Uh, one of them accepts a telemet command, and then this other port, 9999, the main focus of this talk, right off the bat, as soon as you connect to it, will issue an authentication challenge. Or that's what it looks like. I mean, it's got this weird string format. Uh, it issues some sort of odd token, which kind of looks like a shot, and uh, some random integer. All right, this set off alarm bells in my head, and I knew that there was some stuff to, to get from this port. I mentioned earlier that we can download the source for this, the tarball. So that's the next step. So we download this tarball, we crack it open, and it's a bunch of uh, you know nondescript files with cryptic bill numbers and doesn't give you a lot to go off of. We've got the build number in the, uh, the tarball name, so the R850. We have to use the file command on Mac to actually find out more about these files. So what we've got in the main section of this tarball that you can download from the manufacturer is a couple of ASCII text files, another tarball, uh, and then a UBI image for the device. Okay, well, the first thing that I wanted to do was actually unzip this other tarball, go down the rabbit hole, and when I do that, I find a utilities folder that contains all of the scripts that are used to verify the new package when you upload it via USB to the device. Uh, my opinion personally is that it's probably bad security practice to ship verification shell scripts with the new image, especially when they're really easy to edit. And they're not really verified by the other manifest files that are included. Some of these text files will give you a better idea of how they actually 
try and verify the software and have any sort of control over what they're uh, uploading onto the thermostat when you plug in a USB to get a new software. And you'll also see down here at the bottom, it's got a banner switch for either training or American Standard, which uh, it's really a rebranded company and they serve as separate areas of the US. So this device covers a number of companies because it just gets repackaged, reused, and that's a pretty common thing in the IoT, uh, IoT business. A lot of people just try and push it out as quick as they can and they profit off of it. The data that we see here is really just, uh, it's a mishmash of like file size and a couple of random strings that they compress to, uh, to verify. And it's all really easy to audit in the utilities folder that we examined earlier. All right, so we have that UBI image that we saw earlier, and that's pretty important for the rest of the research. There's a number of ways to interact with the UBI image, but what I wanted to do was really get access to all the source code, pull out the files, and be able to you know, search through it, find all the source, and uh, reverse the code. So there's this uh, GitHub project. I have yet to actually meet this guy in person, but I own a couple beers to fairly do. And it made it really easy to just point and click, uh, extract all the files, and get access to the source code. Alright, with the file system, system exposed, we can explore everything. It's really an entire Linux system with a bunch of Ruby gems and modules. And then there's a busy box binary, which is probably the most mysterious part of the whole software package. And with this source code open, we can just do global searches for really easy, low-hanging fruit that we know will be valuable for the research. That includes Ruby mashers. I write a lot of Ruby regexes, so I know what to look for. Uh, and literally, the strings, users, password, all these things you see up here, you do a quick search, you find all. You find stuff like this. So this is just a small snippet of stuff that you would find looking through there for uh, Ruby regex mashers. Again, I don't expect you to read all this right now, but it's pretty, uh, pretty useful for painting the picture of how vulnerable this was and how much there was to find. And it gives us an idea of things that we can get access to, like alarms, chat logs, uh, scheduling history for the house. And we can look for other things like samples. If we look for sample codes, there's commented sample code in the actual source. This is the kind of stuff you want to remove before you actually push out the production product. And for the exact reason that we would expect, it makes it easy to reverse the code. And that includes hard coded passwords. It's like the worst thing you possibly do. And they, uh, they even have the approach of just commenting it out old. And that was how they probably saw a couple old security bugs that got brought to their attention. All right, we have a hard coded username and password. We know this thing's an, uh, issuing an authentication challenge from this one random port. And we also find a bunch of Ruby gems. I'm not sure how many Ruby folks there are in the audience. Uh, Ruby gems are just a package man management system, a lot like Python modules or app get, things like that. So having the ability to find these in the source code, I was really able to just change into this directory, do a bundle install, and they had no requirements on the Ruby server or the gem server. So I was able to download every production gem they have on my local machine. And when I have that, I can then run their specs to generate every type of message that this thing would send. And I can recreate anything that this device would expect or any function that this is expected to do. I can review the tests that they have to find out how it should run. So I kept doing more recon because the stuff I was finding led me to believe that they were pretty insecure. And I found a bunch of stuff on GitHub. This is some of the stuff that's still up there that they think doesn't count as really bad. But some of the really bad stuff that I found included database salts, uh, production IPs for like their main backbone servers, passwords, more hard code passwords. The stuff is just for. So Jeff, can I cut you for a second? All right. Yeah, okay. that went well. <laughs> now to talk. Um, yeah, so Nexia is a separate company, and this really had its own disclosure process. So we had to reach out to Nexia and be like, hey, you guys have got some really bad stuff open in our GitHub repository. And a private GitHub repository is like, what, seven bucks a month? 
So even if I'm the only person subscribing to their service, they should be able to afford private repositories. They closed down a bunch of them. There's a bunch of stuff you can't get access to anymore, and that's a good step, and we're proud to see that. And we've seen already a bunch of these weird strings and authentication challenges, and that brings us to the next step, which is SMIM, or SMILE, SIM, whatever. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. What does it stand for? The best thing that I could find was synchronized multimedia integration language. And the documentation and RFCs for this were really, really weak, pretty thin. There's even comments in the code itself that the next year, next year developers don't fully understand it. So as far as we're concerned, we might as well consider it a, a proprietary language for Nexia and how they administrate the functions of the device and the calls that you can make over this port. And it touches pretty much everything in this. So when you're looking through the code, you find calls to alarm logs, uh, changing the heat temperatures, changing the schedules, enabling SSH, disabling trusted servers, um, changing the pins on the device. Anything you can do, this can do. And this is the first test that you have to pass just to get the thing to start evaluating commands. This is their regex, the first one that they used to check if it's a valid protocol message or not. You won't have success necessarily just by passing this test, but if you can pass this regex, it'll at least evaluate your message uh, and, and pass it through the next step. And it's a pretty weak regex just for disassembling uh, this, this proprietary protocol, which I've got a sample of there in the, uh, the lower section. Okay. So we saw some of this constants file earlier that has hard-coded passwords and a bunch of really bad stuff that you shouldn't have in a hard-coded file. And it gives us a really good idea of everything that we can call through this protocol. And it also gives us an idea of how these actual numbers that we saw uh, work for accessing different calls to the device. And like I said, that's everything. Okay, so we've got an authentication challenge. We know a lot more about how this protocol works from reversing the code. Let's log in. What you see here is one of my first successful actual logins for the device. I had to write a script that emulated their expected login command, which is what you see up at the top above that screenshot. I know it's a little bit ugly to try and uh, look at. But we get the authentication challenge. We do a text digest and a SHA-1. We spit it back out with a couple tricks, including they just added a bunch of commas at the end uh, to pass their test and I guess obscure it more, and we successfully authenticate. And once we do that, we issue a basic subscribe command, which is one of the things that I found in the rest of the code, and we get everything. All right? This is the type of data that it would just stream out constantly. And that includes live environment sensors um, and all these stored settings for the device, like serial numbers, and not just for the thermostat, but for the furnace, and all the relays going to the furnace. So it's really a bad vulnerability to be able to just log in, issue one command, and then you have a constant streaming connection from the device. And the command that I used to actually get access to all the streaming data was stupidly simple. I started from the bottom, worked my way up, so I know, that, I know that it uses these integers as sort of like a domain level access um, model. So I start with one, I use the proprietary two colon uh, format, and I use subscribe, and then this true element, I noticed a couple switches in the code that were looking for true false as a payload, and if you do true, that stands for recursively access every model or every uh, function call from the top level domain. And that's why when you issue that command, you get access to everything. And it streams it constantly. So what I did, was I wrote a script to consume all this stuff as I was getting it, and I just let it run overnight. I go up and I play with it, and I would store it out to the Redis database, and I would parse out uh, separate parts of the protocol. So we've got all the IDs that we noticed are a little bit cryptic, they're a little confusing, and they change. And uh, also command payloads to get a good idea of how they're built. And this makes it really easy to go back later and just say, all right, I've got a nice worth of data. Now tell me which is the most common occurring ID. Or do the authentication IDs that I get back have any uh, properties in common? And it made the analysis really easy. Like I said, things worth tracking include 
authentication IDs, command IDs, uh, payloads you get back. There's a lot of different features that this protocol is trying to do. So it's also uh, reporting analytics back to the backbone servers and it's offering up the ability to change things in that place. This is a snippet of code from the project that's up on my GitHub. And this is how I'd actually authenticate with the device, probe it, and then process it and save it out to Redis server. Uh, the Redis server isn't included in the, the code you guys can download and work with. You can easily add it if you want. You basically just take the payload or whatever property you're interested in show it in the database. But it's a pretty easy protocol to break apart, being a plain text protocol with no type of encryption or private keys or anything. Alright, so we've got access to this IoT thermostat. Do you want to actually cause some real trouble? Or at least find out how much trouble and malicious attack would be caused. This thing is in my house. I didn't want anyone else to be able to set my temperature or potentially freeze my pipes, which was the problem I was looking at when I originally replaced it. So these IDs that we've been looking at, you'll recognize uh, listed out here in this next time. This XML is that smile language that I was mentioning before. And we see uh, a couple of integers in sort of a domain fashion, and then an N, which stands for dynamic ID. And that's where the overnight saving of the streaming data really came in handy to get access to the types of changes we would see in these dynamic IDs and what I needed to do to actually access these functions. So I failed a lot before to see. And the function that was my main focus was set hold. So I want to be able to set and hold the temperature at an arbitrary temperature and make sure that the user had no option to change it. And up at the top, you'll notice uh, some sample code. It's not the exact command, but it gives you a pretty good idea of what type of data it expects. And uh, the command here at the bottom that I typed out is the actual effective command. So we have to first issue a probe to try and find out the native zone. And what I mean by that is this thing is meant to uh, administrate buildings that might have a lot of different spaces. So if you had this in like an airport hangar, you might want the office of the hangar warmer than the actual hangar. Uh, you might want different parts of the school or your corporate building to be different temperatures. So it has a lot of different zones. So first we have to probe it and find out which zone we want to attack. And then we use that as a dynamic ID to set the hold. And that command at the bottom is with the dynamic ID, our target ID, how we actually issue that command. And this is a snippet from the GitHub project that I have available for you guys that actually shows how we do issue the command and uh, get it to hold the temperature against the wishes of the user for really an arbitrary amount of time. It has no rate limiting. There's no security on how often you can issue the command, what types of commands you can issue. So once we have this zone ID, and we are not that decayed with the port, we can just constantly issue every second, or every fraction of a second, as long as you want, the command to set the whole temperature. And it doesn't matter how often you hit the button when you're standing in front of the device, you're never going to be able to outpace the software. So it's really easy to lock the user out, set the temperature on the device, a really, really dangerous situation. And I don't have a live demo because I'm not going to uh, remotely set the temperature in my house here while I'm at the con, but I do have a video for you guys of this in practice. So I connect to my thermostat, which should cha or get the challenge, we issue the authentication command, we get the zone ID, and then we start issuing this denial of service temperature tag. And this is what it looks like when you try and change it. You'll notice up at the top it says get connected. That's a marketing prompt saying, hey, enroll in the next day service. So I'm not even signed up for the $10 a month service. This thing was vulnerable out of the box. All right. It's fully updated, it's not enrolled in the service, and it's still vulnerable to uh, like a DOS attack on your temperature. And imagine the room here being locked out at 90 degrees. That'd be pretty bad. That would clear out the room. That's a pretty dangerous one to go. And if you have the ability to silence alarms, restart the device, you could potentially uh, encounter a scenario where we could start a fire or maybe a heat exchanger failure, which is what we saw earlier, which is a life-threatening issue. So it's a really bad problem. 
And you can also do the inverse, and you can set it for an arbitrarily low temperature. And in Michigan, you know, where you get like negative 10 in the winter, Fahrenheit, uh, that's bad. That's really bad. I can freeze out some of the pipes, basically ruin their entire house. And then if you want, once the pipes are frozen, because you can check for that by checking the temperature sensors, you can warm the house back up again, and now you've flooded the whole place. And this doesn't just apply to homes, it applies to everywhere I found this thing. These commercial buildings, pretty much everywhere you wouldn't want to see them. Alright, so now we can do pretty much everything, and we really can't do everything with this device. And that doesn't include just changing stuff, that includes getting access to really dangerous and sensitive information, like the home heating schedule for the house. Right. The whole idea is that you're supposed to program in when you leave, when you come back. Well, I'm a home invader, or, I don't know, a nation state or something, and I want to get in and plant stuff. You can tell exactly when you're going to leave, when you're going to come back. That's privilege information. Especially when these things are in corporate buildings. It's bad. Now you know when everyone's gone from work, and when they don't care if there's a human in the home, just because they don't expect there to be one. We can also get a bunch of privilege information that can be used to social engineer attack and also augment additional attacks. So every secret that this thing has, like uh, their secret ID, the AU ID, which is really just a section of the MAC address, so it'd be pretty easy to find anyways. We can access that. We can access the next year registration pins, heating schedule, like I said, the serial number, which is something you can use to try and figure out actually uh, what software it would expect to download next when looking at the source. And then also, like I said, additional hardware serial numbers for the furnace and for the relays, anything you could access. And if you're trying to impersonate like the helpful handyman that's coming to fix the furnace problem that you caused in the first place, you can say, oh, you can trust me. I know your serial number. I know your furnace model. And I know what your problem is. So it's bad. We can also access uh, alarms and chat logs. So if we've had problems in the past, we know what that is too. Alright, well now we can do pretty much everything on the device and we know it's really dangerous. So I wanted to build a tool to help really serve as a proof of concept to the manufacturer uh, to fix this problem and also to distribute security tools for the rest of the community. Building a point and click tools with these. After this amount of research, it took me a couple months uh, working on my own home third set. Building a Ruby script where you can just issue a couple commands and find out if uh, one of these devices is vulnerable. And if it is, update uh, the services and change the parameters of your heating and everything. It's really easy. So that's what I went ahead and did. And I built two scripts really. Uh, one that's sort of read-only and it will pull out all the privilege information that you would expect, but it won't actually damage it in case you're using a sonic client or trying to just issue a finding for security audit. And the other one is more active and dangerous than you can issue commands. And there are another, a number of other things too with this device, like the private keys that ship with it uh, would grant you access to the corporate back home server. That's how it would communicate. The first way that it would pass port data of how to connect is it would SSH back into the corporate backbone, give it a port number to an arbitrary script, and then expect communication over that device. We can also do things like change uh, the trusted server, so we can cut it off in the command control server for Nexia, and then we can set up our own server, an arbitrary IP, I use my laptop, as the trusted uh, command control server for the device. So, They'll never know that you're messing with it or that you're issuing commands to change the heating because you completely removed it from the awareness of the command control servers. So obviously the tool is called Trainwreck. I thought it was kind of familiar. Uh, there's a couple of different scripts like I mentioned. Trainwreck Ruby script is the read-only script that allows you to safely figure out if one of these things is vulnerable. And then we also have the derailleur script, which is the tapping. And that'll allow you to uh, change the trusted servers and arbitrarily DOS a maximum heat setting or a maximum cold setting. 
And then, of course, training your next single, which is intended just for you to play with your own commands if you're doing research on this. It's just a one-off, uh, not repeating command. It makes it really easy to test. And it's really easy to use. Just download it from the GitHub. If you have any comments or questions, find me. I'm more than willing to answer them. The way you use it is pretty easy. You can edit these yourself if you want. But you really just point it at the target ID, and you can also stay connected. So if you want to build your own uh, information recording on this, you can stay connected to a device overnight, arbitrarily, uh, or not at all. And you can just issue one command. That's the scenario I was talking about before, where we pretty much issue one command and constantly add data from what's coming out of it. All right. Derailer, uh, like I mentioned, you can do a number of things. You can just point at a target again, and you can change the heat, cold, or you can mess with it and disconnect it from the command and control service. And this was the kind of stuff that really got their attention um, when we disclosed these vulnerabilities and got them to change it. All right, scope of the problem. Like I said, you were able to find this in pretty much everywhere you wouldn't want to. And that just doesn't include homes, which is really creepy. First, that you can get people's schedules when they leave their house and mess with their temperature while they're home. But you also can find these in transportation hubs, corporate buildings, including security companies that have these in their corporate offices. I was kind of surprised to find that. And uh, utility stations, so power stations, some of them use these. And that's why it's pretty scary. Uh, the vendor claims that everything was patched. And they never really actually reached out to me to verify this. So I'm sure there's still a lot of opportunity. I'm giving them a little bit of a break before I come back after them. Um, but there's a number of different things that you could do. It's dangerous. Obviously, you can mess with the building and screw up uh, the infrastructure. But you can also do things like lock them out with the derailer script and then demand some sort of ransom to not damage the building. You can also, like I said, impersonate uh, somebody who's expected to work on this with all the privileged information you get. And then there's all the additional information that allows you to connect to the command and control server that's not just supposed to administer this device, but all their network of devices. They're pre-shipping private keys with the firmware that you can just break apart like we already did, and then you can access their command and control server. It's not good. And when their business is being in your business and connecting to all your different IoT devices, Really, really not good. All right. There's additional problems with this that are basically just systemic problems that are a little harder for them to address unless they rebuild this entirely. And that includes software downloads can be forced. So obviously, we said you can download uh, the USB image to upload to the device, and also does over-the-air updates, which was good once they finally realized this was a problem. They claimed that they were allowed, or that they were able to patch every device that they had access to, which means not every device is patched. But they claim they were able to roll out a device to turn off the support by the time that we first did this talk. It's also vulnerable to DNS spoofing, especially for some of the external services and analytics that it uses. I mentioned before that it relies on a not that good website for all the other data, and it will totally swallow spoof DNS requests uh, to these websites and these other services. And of course, the private keys that are shipped to the device is horrible. They might have some sort of privilege uh, restriction on the users that can actually SSH into the device, but it's still a horrible problem to have this free ship. You can tell it bugs me. It allows a lot of vulnerability. And when I started looking for them to find out how many there were, of course, they're mainly in the US, so that's where this company is based. It's Train and American Standard, which are owned by Angry Soul Rand. They're all over. So these are just the ones that use this particular protocol and that fit the uh, platform ID that we focus on. They have a number of different IoT thermostats, and they were everywhere. And this is Shodan, of course. It's a great tool for finding these type of things. Even if you don't have one of these devices, you can still look throughout Google and do Google Dorking for uh, package files and tarballs from companies of interest examine it for unique protocols, and then look for these types of things on showing. And at the time when I was first doing the research, it started out like 24 or 25 devices that were publicly available. That means someone has 
universal plug and play enabled on the router, something like that, for sure these weak Wi Fi settings. And it kept growing. And the problem kept getting worse. Eventually, when they were playing around for updates, they just started dumping the data out of the internet. Uh, so I'd be cruising around for these devices, and you see uh, an entire person's private data for their house and their home schedule being pushed out on the internet. And a lot of these things have definitely dialed back, so you won't find as many results for these devices anymore, because they actually did do a reasonably good response to updating the firmware, which we're happy to see. All right, I said that there's two companies in play here, and they do a lot of different things. So we've got Nexia. Nexia is the IoT command and control service they administer a lot of different things that include locks, plugs, lights, uh, anything you could possibly imagine that an IoT device would do, they want to have a part of it. And then you've got Ingersoll RAND, which administers corporate level and private level uh, heating and cooling solutions for portable trucks, AC. Um, they also make club cars, which are golf carts. That would be fun to exploit. And then also some more scary stuff like CNC controllers and a lot more big corporate infrastructure that could potentially be dangerous. And notifying them of this problem was its own problem. So the concept of the vendor not wanting to listen to a security disclosure is a common one. And when we first notified them, and by we I mean uh, Carl Sigler, a great guy I work with at Trustwave, he heads up the entire disclosure department. And without his help and the firm disclosure policy trustway, probably would not have gotten fixed, or at least definitely not as fast. A couple other information security disclosures that uh, this company had received before it took almost two years for them to update, and we were able to get them to issue an update to address at least the basic problem within three or four months. And the whole principle was that, hey, there's a proof of concept code that's going to be coming out. They're easy to find, and there's going to be talks. And they were still a little apprehensive about communicating with us about the code. We were able to get them to change some of their security policies, so now they actually have a proper email alias. So if they get another security researcher, like you guys, or myself, when I do additional research, they have a proper channel, or they're supposed to, to handle these type of requests and actually get these things fixed. Because that's what we want, right? We don't want to just mess with people in their homes or their, their corporate offices. We want to actually get the vendor to fix the problem, because that's our goal. And we were able to get it done. And it didn't take two years to do, it took just a few months. So we're really happy to see that. And there's other problems at home. So we've seen a number of sort of lax posture issues from this company and also Nexia. And it really just illustrates that the problems are all over. I was doing Googling, Google Dorting, for security, uh, or not security, but serial numbers that I found when looking through my own data from my device. And I started finding that their security area of their website was completely indexed on Google. So, sure, they have a little login page, but their entire security area of their website was indexed on Google and open to everybody. And that's another real basic problem. To me, that's right up there with hard code passwords. It's just something that you know not to do. So here's my information. I encourage all of you to contact me, especially if you want to do some of your own analysis on this firmware. Uh, it was a pretty interesting package to do, or to reverse engineer, especially with all the shell scripts, Ruby codes, the pretty weak protocols. And uh, I encourage you guys to try the tool, or at least look for these type of software downloads, and evaluate them yourself. And even though they might not have the link for the current software package up there, it's pretty easy to get access to, and that's just done with a little bit of analysis of the code package, and you can find, using the serial number and platform ID, what the new download is. And if any of you want to try and find that out, come talk to me, and I'll help you out with it. And that's pretty much it. Thank you.